when you understand the things of god then you begin to see a lot of profit when you understand the word what it means to you as a believer and to a church in general you begin to benefit when you don't know you perish anything that dominates the thought of a man you get it so meaning that you need to have the right thought about something but when you see his government first his rule first his interest first we can know the interest of god from the written word we can know what he's putting first Unconditional love for your unfailing love. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you, Jesus. Fire, 
word of the Lord. Dry bones, see the word of the Lord. Dry bones, see the word of the Lord. Dry bones, see the word of the Lord. He's risen. He's risen. Saturday was silent. Saturday was silent. Saturday was silent. But something was happening. A grave could not hold him. Friday's disappointment. Ah, his Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has impossible ever stopped you your way? Since when has impossible ever stopped you your way? My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha if there's anything that he can't do just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden what happens when God says to move Was 
celebrate him. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Celebrate him. The tomb is empty. Celebrate him. Nothing will ever stop you. Nothing. Nothing can stop you. Nothing will ever stop you. Nothing will ever stop you. Nothing will ever stop you. The devil cannot stop you. The world cannot stop you. Satan cannot stop you. Sickness cannot stop you. Poverty cannot stop you. Nothing can 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 stop you. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Who has ever, who has, what has ever stopped him? What has ever stopped him? Savior. Since when? Since when? Poverty can never stop you. Death can never stop you. Economy can never stop you. Sickness can never stop you. Since when? Since when? Has the impossible ever stopped Jesus? Since when? He came out of the grave with glory. I want to tell you, nothing will stop you. I said nothing will stop you. Nothing in the world will ever stop you. Nothing in this country will ever stop you. Nothing designed by the devil will ever stop you. Since when has the impossible ever stopped him? I tell you, nothing will stop your marriage. Oh yes, nothing will stop your business. Nothing will stop your promotion. Nothing will stop wealth from coming into your hands. Oh, nothing will stop resources from coming into your heart. Nothing will stop you. In this city, nothing will stop you. Since when has the impossible ever stopped Jesus? The grave could not stop him. Listen, the grave could not stop him. Nothing will stop you. There's something new that has happened. Whatever has died in your life has been brought back to life. He has been brought back to life. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Celebrate the Father. For, his, for the risen Jesus. For the risen Christ. Celebrate the Father for the risen Christ. He is risen. 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 of that and because of that nothing is impossible nothing is possible because of that nothing is impossible nothing is impossible we bless his name let's pray just lift up your hands and just 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 ponder about his mercy ponder about his mercy Ponder about his mercy. What Christ went through and even his coming back to life is because of his mercies. Ponder about it. Father, we thank you. We thank you that because Christ is alive, because he came out of the grave, because he overcame death, 
nothing is impossible for us. Nothing impossible for us who have believed. Nothing. Nothing is impossible in this world. Nothing. 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 Nothing is, is impossible for those who are watching and believing you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing impos is impossible. We bless your name, Father. We give you glory. We give you honor. You are wonderful. You are mighty. You are gracious. Father, open our hearts to receive your word. To realize what you have done for us. To take it, to grab at it, Lord, by faith. With the hands of faith. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for blessing us. We give you glory and honor. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen, 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 amen. You can take your seats. God bless you, choir. Can you clap for the choir? They are very smart. Amen. Can you clap for your neighbor? They are very smart. Can you clap for yourself? You are very smart. <laughs> Praise God. We thank God for this Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Praise God. We are here to celebrate the risen Christ. Praise God. We are here to bless our God, to celebrate our God for the risen Christ. It's a day of celebration. This is the greatest day for believers. Praise God. So powerful. So great. We are blessing God for the risen Christ. To bless means to celebrate. In this uh, context here. We are celebrating God. For the risen Christ. Praise God. I was thinking about. The masses of God. It is too much. It is too much. His kindness. His mercy is his kindness. I'm telling you. It is too much. It's so great. People of God, don't take the coming of Jesus out of the grave for granted. Some people rang me about their miracles. When we're celebrating his death on Friday, how God has healed them. Praise God. One of those people are not here. If the person was here, I would have asked the person to testify. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. That Friday service we had here, and even now as we are remembering, huh? the resurrection of Christ, anything is possible. Something will change in your life. In fact, something has changed. Something has changed. I was looking at it, at his death. In one stroke, he became poor and he became rich. That one at least is not, not spiritual riches because Jesus has never been spiritually poor. But that is financial riches, material riches. Why does material things and financial things count for a believer? It is for service. It is for service. You need it for service. You need it for making humanity better. You need it for blessing people. You need it for helping yourself. You need it for glorifying God. You need it. There's no father who is not happy when their children do well. There's no father. In fact, it is their joy when you do well. Praise God. But the problem is always with us. We don't most of the time qualify to have that. So that's why we, we remain languishing sometimes in need. Because there are people, if God is to bless them, is blessing them to lose them, they will run away from him. I mean financially. Because they have not yet matured enough to handle it. So God cannot reward you to lose you. No. So that's why it is important for us to mature. Praise God. Another thing he did at the cross, look. He became a cast 
for us. He died to remove our curse. When the curse is removed, the blessing flows. When the curse is removed, the blessing flows. That's why you're a candidate of God's blessings. I was looking at those masses. What they did on the cross. The exchange that took place on the cross. There are many. We can't even exhaust them now. I was looking at that. All because of his masses. His masses. His kindness. Now let's look at this story. The story of, 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 of Jesus Christ. Matthew 28 verse 2 to 7. Let's look at this testimony of, of how he came out of the grave. Let's look at this testimony. There was a violent earthquake. That is Ma Matthew chapter 28 verse 2 to 7. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciple, he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I've told you. Praise God. Look at this beautiful story. Look at the end of the cross. Look at the empty tomb. Look at the empty tomb. The hope of the world. Look at the empty tomb. The testimony of scripture. Let me tell you. Cling to the Lord. Have faith in his word. Persevere. Your life will end in glory. I say your life will end in glory. Amen. And that glory begins now. Amen. The scripture is true. The scripture is true. How many empty graves are there where the body went away to, to be with God? How many? How many? They are not there. They are never, never. There was, there was never any anyway. But because even Enoch just went. He did not die. Even Elijah was just carried. Elisha saw, saw, saw his master going. Those are the people we, we, we knew. So we are here to bless the almighty God for the risen Christ. Praise God. Now, I want us to look at this scripture. There's something very interesting in this scripture. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. Something very interesting. Blessed from verse number 3 to 5. We are just reading 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Praise God. Now, we see something very strange here. Normally, God is the one that blesses people. But in this scripture, Apostle Peter is saying, blessed be the Father. Blessed be. It's the opposite. We are used to God blessing us. But now, we see Peter saying, why, why we should, we are, we, we are being told here that we can bless the almighty God. God's people can bless him. God blesses people because he's the source of all things. He blesses us because he's the source. The Hebrew word father has a root meaning. Father, in Hebrews, the root, when you dig the root, you find that it means source. So the word father means source. Even the earthly father represents the heavenly father. It's a shadow of the heavenly father. Source. That's why fathers must provide for their family. The men who are here, provide for your wives and children. Provide. 
Some men don't make any effort. They want to live on their wives. Don't do that. You're a father. You're a father. They just sit. They don't do anything. You have to be close to God. You have to do his will. So when God blesses us, he's filling a certain gap, a certain need in our lives. But when we bless God, we are recognizing that he has no luck. We are recognizing him as our source for everything. When we bless him, we are saying, Lord, you are our source. When God blesses us, he blesses us because he's the source of everything. But when we bless him, we are recognizing him and thanking him for being our source. Praise God. We recognize that he doesn't lack and that is our source. Now in that verse 3, when Peter was blessing the Lord, he was responding with worshipful thanksgiving. He was just celebrating God. He was responding to what God has done, to the blessing that God has lavished on them, on the church. He was just responding in worship, in worship, in celebration. And when we bless God, we put our, or give him thanks, because that is really thanksgiving. Celebrating God with thanksgiving, with worship. The moment you begin to celebrate God with thanksgiving and with worship, you position yourself to receive from him. You position him, yourself to receive. You position yourself to receive. And as he was worshiping God, celebrating him, he came to a point where he began to list down heavy things that God has done for you and me. Heavy things. Heavy things. In that, 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 that scripture is loaded. Heavy things. Wait here matters. Wait here list of reasons why he was celebrating God, why we should celebrate him. The heavy thing that, things that God has done for us. And which makes it right for us to bless him. To bless him. He declared the blessing. Then be, turn into the heavy things now. To begin high, listing them one by one. What God has done for you. I want us to look at that. As we celebrate this Easter. Let's look for those heavy things that God has done for us. Praise God. I'm telling you. I never forget them. Never. Never. Never forget them. Here are the five blessings. Reason for blessing the father. Five, number one. We bless the father because he's a father of endless mercy. Endless mercy. And that's why Apostle Peter said, according to his great mercy, he referred to it as a great mercy. A great kindness. A great kindness. It's a big thing. Let me tell you, church, out of God's mercy, we receive many blessings. We get a lot out of his mercy. Out of his mercy. Out of his kindness. Everything God does for us comes from his mercy. Springs from his mercy. His mercy. His kindness. He's a kind father. He's a kind. Whatever he does comes out of his kindness. Comes out of his mercy. Not because there's something you have done that has caused him to move, to do something for you. No, not really because of something you have done. But because of his mercy. Whatever manifests in our lives that shows his glory is out of his mercy. Out of his mercy. A, be a believer's life is lived on God's mercy. Your life is lived on God's what? Mercy. And you live responding to God's mercy. The kindness of God. The mercy of God. The mercy of God. Now, God does not owe anybody anything. You can imagine. Pastor Ken cannot tell God that pay me back. <laughs> You owe me. You owe me something. <laughs> Pay me back. <laughs> you owe me something. No, God does not owe anybody 
anything. Hmm? And many people who reject God, the core reason is they think that God owes them something. That is the source of many people rejecting God. They think God owes them something. They think they deserve something from God. They think they have earned something from, uh, from God. Sometimes you can tell God, oh God, you see, you see now, I've done A, B, C, D, I've done A, B, C, D. Now why are you not doing something for me? Why, why Lord, why are you not doing something for me? And, and some people even turn away from, they reject God. You don't care, they reject him. Because they think God owes them something. He does not owe you. God does not owe you. <laughs> so why that happens is because sin has made us proud. Sin makes people proud. So we despise the mercy. We don't look at the fact that it is out of his mercy that we are surviving. So people despise the mercy of God. Is we should look at things from the point of mercy. God is completely holy and so powerfully good. So powerfully good. He's so good. He's so holy. He's so powerful. He's so good that really there's nothing he needs from you. There's nothing he needs from you apart from worship. You worship him for who he is. You worship him for who he is. So you can't approach God on the basis of anything you have done for God. Be terrified when you begin to approach him that God, I've done A, B, C, D. I need A, B, C, D. Be, let, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Rather, let's approach him through the mercy. His mercy that he has manifested through Christ. Through what Jesus has done for us. Through what Je we approach him through what Jesus has done for us. We have been seeing what he has done for us on the cross. Approach him through that. Through what Jesus has done for you. So if you want money from him, tell him that he became poor. In one stroke he became poor in order to make me rich. I am rich. I am rich. He became in one stroke he became poor in order to make me rich. I am rich. Let that thing enter your spirit. When it's coming out of that your spirit, it is liberating. It will set you free. It will set you free from want. It will set you free from ignorance. It will set you free from lack. Something very big happened in our service here on Friday. How many of you were not in that service? In a very big number. But it's not late. You can receive what we received on Friday now. Praise God. You see, it's very interesting. After the Holy Communion service here, early in the morning on Saturday as I was waking up, I had a very interesting, very interesting dream. Very interesting dream. In fact, it was a vision. It's like you're sleeping, like you're awake. <laughs> I just felt very clearly that all my financial debt, any, any need of money I have, debts, that I was completely delivered from all debts. Imagine in that revelation, I, I realized that my debts, all my debts were reduced to 10 cents. 10 cents, 10 Ugandan cents. Can we imagine? Are you listening? 10 cents. In other words, I'm out of what? <laughs> Can you clap to the Lord? <laughs> you have not yet even realized the point. That same grace that God manifested it through that vision is the grace that came upon you on Friday. Your debts were reduced. Financial, financial debts were reduced to nothing. To 10 cents. 
Who has 10 cents in your, your, your belonging at home? Do you have 10 cents? Because when this, man, when, when this money first came into place, the 10 cents were there. Eh? They have disappeared completely. <laughs> they are no longer significant. In other words, I have no debt. And the number 10 is a number of law and order. Oh, yes. That's why Moses was given 10 commandments. The number 10 also signifies uh, a tithe. A tithe. I've been obedient so much. I've been obedient. God is telling me that, look, your tithe has caused me to remember you and reduce all that you lack. Because when you're in debt, you're in lack. Praise God. Imagine your debts have been reduced to 10 cents. Receive the financial grace that will get you out of every lack. Receive the financial grace that gets you out of every lack. Receive the financial grace. Even those who are watching online, receive the financial grace that is getting you right now out of financial lack in the mighty name of Jesus. Because that's what happened on the cross. We were, we were, when we were celebrating the, the death of Christ here, huh? through the Holy Communion, we looked at that scripture, that in one stroke, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9, in one stroke, he became poor, and we became rich. You became rich. In one stroke, Christ became poor, and you became rich. A stroke happened just like this. And that's when he cried on the cross and said, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Let me tell you, that is how miracles come. And that's how some people got healed on Friday. Completely healed. Even me, I got completely healed. There's some injury, completely healed. There was some injury on my, my leg because of some exercise I did some time back. My leg got injured. But let me tell you, that thing completely disappeared in the morning. <laughs> completely in the morning. It was not there. In fact, the person who rang me said, I didn't know that this is how Je that Jesus is real and can heal in a real way. Can we imagine? I said, now let them ask uh, Sister Mary Magdalene, who was delivered from cancer. <laughs> She's just laughing. <laughs> the lady told I said, but you know what I was praying for, that particular sister. And, and the Lord spoke to me and said, if she only knew, if she could only uh, 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 trust in my word, if she could only trust, that I was praying for her, and the Lord said, if she could only trust my word, if she could only, so I told her, I said, <laughs> you would have come out of all these problems. You, you, God just says you should just only trust his word. That's what faith is. Faith is being sure that what God promises in his word is able to carry it out. Praise God. Can you imagine, Elder Jasper, your, your debt has been written off. Your debt has been written off. In fact, to prepare you for billionaireship, <laughs> tell your neighbor, say you are looking at a billionaire. Turn to another neighbor and say you are looking at a billionaire. Turn to the neighbor by and say, you're a billionaire. <laughs> Give the Lord a mighty heart of praise. <laughs> Can we imagine? Can we imagine what celebrating the death of Christ was, did for us? Can we imagine? Now, today we are celebrating his resurrection. Resurrection. Look at that. So, so we, are, it is, we approach God through what Christ has done for us. Through his mercy. He's a father of mercies. What Christ has done for us, it is Christ that hand. It is Christ. It is Christ. We do not earn anything. God does not owe us anything. But Christ has a hand for us. Big things. 
great blessings. And so we approach the Father through that. He's a Father of mercies. Remember when Jesus cried on the cross. He said, my Father, my Father, why have you abandoned me? It was a very terrible cry. Because our sins had separated him from his father. And he was feeling the loneliness. He was feeling the terror. People who have gone to hell and come back to life, they tell you that the feeling in hell is a feeling of terror and loneliness. Terror and loneliness. And yet it's a sea of people. But you, feel, you don't feel your neighbor. Why? Because you are separated from God. That's why Christ cried. Praise God. Number two, we bless the Father because he has caused us to be born again. To be born again. Look at what Apostle Peter said. According to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again. Look at that. Linda, you are born again. You are born again. That's a big thing. That's why Peter was celebrating God. He was giving him thanks was celebrating the Father. The new birth is the first thing that comes out of God's mercy. The new birth is the first thing that comes out of, your, of, of God's mercy. He caused us to be born again. He caused us, the Father, caused us out of his mercy to be born again. And you know what that means? Without it, you have nothing. Without being born again, you have what? Nothing. You have nothing. You can't see the kingdom of God. You cannot even enter it. You cannot see it. You cannot even enter it. That's what Nicodemus was told. Nicodemus went to him. He was a, a man of prominence in that society at that time. He went to see Jesus at night. He began by saluting Jesus and recognized that he was a great teacher. And look at what Jesus told him in John chapter 3, verse 3 to 5. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born again when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. We are born into human families by our natural parents. And we are born into God's family through the spirit of God, through his word and through his Holy Spirit. Causes us to be born. The father causes us to be born again because of Christ. Because Christ came back to life. So you see now in Peter's statement there, he said, because he caused us to be born again. He caused us to be born again. Look at it. Through the resurrection of Christ. Through what? If Christ never resurrected, you will never be what? Born again. Look at that. So, out of his mercy, the first thing, big thing that came out of his mercy, he caused us to be born again. He caused us to... Without that, you have nothing and you are lost. You are lost. You will not even see the kingdom. You cannot even enter it. You cannot see it. You cannot even enter it. So you cannot get anything from God. Nothing eternal. Nothing eternal from him. And when you became born again, you became a new creature. A new what? Creature. Not only a new creature, a new everything. Everything became new. I'm telling you. Everything. Everything became new for you. Everything became new for you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creation, the old has gone, the new has come. You are not the old you. Maximize what God has done in your life. Maximize it. Maximize it. Your entrance into the kingdom of God. Maximize it. Look at Ezekiel 36 verse 26 to 27. What God said. When he was talking about the new birth. I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you. Your old heart of stone. And give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And move you to follow my decrees. And be careful to keep my laws. When you get born again. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. And begins to guide you. If you will allow him. 
In fact, the Bible says you, you cannot sin if you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. You can't sin. Your spirit man that is indwelt by the Holy Spirit cannot sin. Normally, we just ignore him. We ignore the voice of God. Then we sin. Made it very clear. In 1 John 3, 8, he made it clear. So, if, what every human being needs is a new what? Bath. Is a new what? Bath. It is the only answer to the evil which is there. When a man who is addicted to drug gets a new bath, he comes out of the drug. When a drunkard gets a new bath, he comes out of drunkardness. When a murderer receives the new bath, he stops murdering people. When a robber receives the new bath, he stops robbing. I'm telling you, what the world needs is a new bath. Those Western nations who are obsessed with abortion and homosexuality, obsessed really, is an obsession. They're political leaders and their society. They're obsessed with it. What they need is a new bath. They are now murdering millions of children without even thinking a second time. Why? They're overtaken by evil. But what they need for that to change you, is not anything else. A new bath. A new bath. A new bath, nothing else. They don't need a new economy. They don't need cars. They don't need, you know, with, even if they have that, it won't change the quality of their lives. No. The quality of their lives. You know why they run to drugs? Because there's no hope. There's no hope. Let me tell you. You have the resurrected Christ. You have him. You have him. Praise God. Amen. Number three, we bless the Father because he has given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. A living hope. And that living hope is actually the new birth. It brings us to the resurrection glory with our resurrected Christ. To the resurrected glory with our resurrected Christ. That's why during baptism, we are buried in water like Christ died and was buried. As we are coming out of the water, like Christ rose from the dead to, to a new life, to a glorious life. So we also rise out of that water to a new life, not the life of sin, not the previous life, a new life. A new life, that's the meaning of baptism. A new life. And that is called the living hope. The living hope. The new life is the living hope. Let me tell you, church. Human beings run on hope. All human, human beings run on hope. Evelyn, they run on hope. When you were doing your course at the university there, you did it because you, you hoped that it would make you happy. Don't you think? Yeah, you go to work. Why do you go to work all the time? You hope that something good will come out. Hope. Why do we take children to school? It is because of hope. Whatever we do is because of hope, a certain hope. I'm telling you the truth. It's because of hope. That it will make us happy. But let me tell you, all those hopes that we have, sometimes they can disappoint you. Because they are not living hope. Oh yes. Because they are not living hope. Sometimes people get the hope that they are going to be this and that and that. And they don't become. And they get disappointed. Some of them commit suicide even because they have a lot of money, but they commit suicide. Recently, a, a, a billionaire committed suicide in South Africa. But they have all the money. No, when the, the moment the hope is gone, 
A person commits suicide because they don't have hope. Whatever they are trusting in disappointed them. But the hope that God gives you is called a living hope. It can never disappoint you. Because that living hope is protected by the living Savior, the living Christ, the resurrected Christ. It's protected. It cannot disappoint you. So we bless the Father because he's the author of the immortal, immortal hope. Hope that cannot die. Sister Annette, hope that cannot die. Hope that cannot die. Hope that cannot die. So in Christ, your hope will be realized. Praise God. Even in the temporal life here. And then in the eternal life. That's why we bless the Father. That's why this man, Apostle Peter, decided to bless the Father. Number four. We bless the Father because... We are born again to imperishable inheritance. Imperishable inheritance. Now, look at that part of the passage. According to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ, from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Just look at this statement. You see, Solomon spoke something in Proverbs 13.22. Let's put on that Proverbs 13.22 and we see. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored for the righteous. You see, good fathers leave something for their children. Leave a house, but that house still grows old. Leave cars, but those cars, some, they eventually become outdated. If they have not worked on what was given to them so that they keep buying, replacing the cars before they know it, everything is gone. In other words, even what we receive from our earthly fathers are perishable. We eventually lose them. But what Peter is saying is what we get from our God, our heavenly father, is imperishable. It's imperishable. But the, the inheritance of God the Father gives us an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance. Imperishable. It simply means it can't be lost. It can't die. It can't die. An inheritance that will not go anywhere. It is there permanently for you. Just look at that. You know why this man was blessing God? He looked at the kind of inheritance that God has worked out for him. For us. That cannot perish. Undefiled. Look at that word. Not touched by sin. Not touched by sin. Undefiled. Not touched by sin. Unfading. Not subjected to depreciation. The law of depreciation, you know it. Degeneration is there on all natural things. They begin to break down. But you can imagine what the inheritance that he has for us is there, cannot fade. It is enjoyed in infinity for eternity. It is infinite and then it is for eternity. You just look at that. You cannot, you cannot exhaust that inheritance. You can't exhaust it. And, and the biggest thing about it is the inheritance that God has decided to give us shows that we are sons. We are sons. Tell your neighbor, say you're a son or you're a daughter. Turn to another person, say me, I'm a daughter or I'm a son. <laughs> it's powerful it means you are in a family God's family born into his family through this resurrected Christ 
That's why we should love one another. Because we're in one family. One father. One faith. One faith. That's why Apostle Paul told, told the, uh, the, the people in Ephesus. He told them that we have one faith. One unity. One baptism. One Lord. The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit inside you lives inside me. So it unites. The Holy Spirit unites us. The same God living inside me lives inside you. Look at that. Look at that. So we are one family. That's what makes us one family. And our faith is in Jesus. The same Jesus we have believed in is the same Jesus I have believed in. One faith. Praise God. Powerful. Powerful. Number five, we bless the Father because he's guiding us through faith for a glorious unveiling. A glorious unveiling. There's a glorious unveiling coming. Unveiling of our salvation. He mentioned that in verse number five. We are protected by the power of God through faith for his salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at that. Revealed. God does not give you new birth. He does not give you living hope. He does not give you unfading inheritance which, can, which are reversible. Uh -uh. Which are reversible. Which can be undone. No. It is permanent. It is permanent, but it must be protected through faith, by faith. It is by faith. When you are saved, it is permanent, but that salvation should be protected by your faith. By your faith. Some people will say, ah, it is already done, it's already done. Why do you need faith? We are told that it is protected through our faith. So now when you stop believing in the Lord, what happens? You see? You stop doing things that he doesn't stand for. What happens? It simply now means we must persevere. Guided through faith. Write John 6, 37 to 40. You will go and read it. John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40. At the same time, perseverance is needed. You must persevere. You must persevere. Yes, you have received all those powerful blessings. But persevere in the Lord. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. Go and read it. So through your faith, your, the Father's powerful arm keeps you guarded. Keeps that salvation guarded until when it is unveiled when you join him in heaven. Unveiled in the last day. In the last day. When the kingdom of men have become the kingdom of our Lord. When, many, when consummation has taken place, what do we believe by faith? What do we believe by faith? We believe in what Christ has done for us. We believe that he has loved us. And that cannot change. He cannot change his mind about us. So we are standing on that. That nothing can remove us from God. Nothing can fail us, our salvation. That's what we have believed. Jesus, after all, proved his love for us by dying on the cross for us. And remember, every power in the universe is subject to the Father. It's subject to God. Every power in the universe. Look at that. There's no power in the universe that is not subject to God. It's not there. He has the last word over everything. And that's why he placed Jesus Christ there on the throne to rule for him. And after, and he'll put all the enemies under the feet of Jesus. And the last enemy to be put under the feet of Jesus is what? Eh? Death. And then he'll pick the kingdom and hand it over to his father. Praise God. <laughs> but let me tell you, even now the sting of death has been dealt with. Do you really fear death like an unbeliever fears? You don't. You don't. You don't. 
Even those who seem to have backslidden, the Bible has a word for them. Go and read it later. Go and read it. First John chapter 2, verse number 19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But they are going to show that none of them belong to us. Sometimes you see some people leave and they look like they have backslidden permanently. They are not believed in the first place. They do, they do not have faith in the Lord. <laughs> when you have faith in him, nothing will remove you. You will see the unveiling of your salvation. You will see the consummation. Praise God. Lift up your hands and let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we give you glory and honor. Father, we bless your name. You are wonderful. You are mighty. You are gracious. We thank you for what you have done for us. Father, thank you for these people here. Your own people. Father, we thank you because you have loved them enough to keep protecting them. You have loved us enough to keep protecting us. We bless your name, Lord. We give you glory and we give you honor. Father, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you for what you have done for us. We bless you for your mercies. Your mercy. Your mercy. We bless you for your kindness. For your word. We thank you for what you have done for us through your son. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the blessing, the temporal blessing. We thank you for the eternal blessing. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory and we give you honor. We thank you for a new birth. Thank the Lord for a new birth, for your new birth. Thank him. Thank him. Because of that, dear friend, perhaps you have no saving relationship with God and you love God and you want to engage with him. But you don't know how. I want to show you how. In John chapter 10, verse number 9, Jesus said, I am the door. Whoever enters to me shall be saved. It's the door into the kingdom of God. Right now, you can enter a relationship with the Almighty God. You can do that through a simple prayer of commitment that you can make to God right now through Him. And if you are ready to enter a relationship with God so that you can be a child of God, bona fide child not just a creation not just a creature of god created by god but a son a daughter follow this simple prayer of commitment after me say dear jesus i come to you as a sinner forgive all my sins i repent of my sins right now i invite you come into my heart be my lord and my savior amen if you say that prayer from your heart, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Find a Bible teaching church near you where you can go and fellowship in order to go spiritually. If you live in the city of Kampala, you are most welcome to come and worship with us at Victory Church of Christ Ministries International in New Zero, Kampala. And the word we share in these services will never allow your life to remain the same. And let us know about the commitment we have made through our contacts on the screen. We'll send you some material through the uh, mail, through your email, so that you can be edified and you can know how to walk in your new phone life with God. God bless you abundantly. I wait to hear from you. Amen.